use the chat as well, guys, as well. If you don't feel that you want to talk, there's a chat there feature as well. So um, at the moment here, you should be seeing on the screen uh, Microsoft Paint. Is that correct? Yeah, cool, great. All right, so we started to start. What? Um, no, no better place to start than uh, what is a network? So what is a network? So network or uh, net, this is, if I go on the verb, networking is the movement of data from a source device to a destination device. Networking is all about the movement of information from source device point A to a destination device point B. There we go. Let's see if the class finished, guys. Thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> now, that's basically it in a nutshell. It's the movement of information from a source device to a destination device. So really, the most important word here is movement data as well. But from in terms of networking, it's a movement. You know, network engineers are, are road builders. We're responsible for putting down the road on which the information it passes from point A to point B. Your if the road breaks, um, you were responsible for having an alternative path that the information can go from point A to point B. So lots and lots of kind of roles that would fall under. Um, I said we have John here, and Paul here, under the remit of a network engineer. Stability, the movement of information from a source device, here's John's laptop, to a destination device. So why would we need to network? What are really sp specific reasons for networking? So just write this down. Uh, so um, to, 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 for communication. 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 Um, sharing resources. Communication, you know, we're sentient beings, human beings are sentient beings, we like to communicate, we like to talk to each other, and um, we have all these available tools that we use to, to communicate, um, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, um, uh, LinkedIn, Zoom here, we're all communicating with, 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 with you guys, um, Twitter, all sorts of media tools are, 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 are forms of communication, um, yes. Skype, um, WhatsApp, Another one there is sharing resources. So this is an interesting one. Just excuse me, I just want to take out the top here. Sharing resources. So if I look at this here, and let's like take an example of a specific network, and we'll have a look at these two, two these two in more detail. Yeah. So let's look at we got a user over here. Hi, Tony. Hi, Lee. How are you? Good to be back. <laughs> yeah. No problem logging in there, did you? Oh, uh, yeah. I, was, uh, I haven't used this PC in a while, so no, no I'd update Zoom and all that, so we're oh, online yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hello. We're just going through um, what is network, so it's um, just taking a specific company. So let's say we have a company here um, and we make we let's say we, we we sell phones okay and our company is based in Dublin okay so we sell phones in Dublin and um, so we, we got John we got Paul here so we got some people's laptops so we got John we got Paul so, so Joe I'm I always use Small names, Joe, Bob, Sue, and Al. Okay, we've got all these laptops. So everybody has their own different laptop. And like I said, we're a company, we sell phones. We're in the Dublin office. Everybody has their own laptop. So this is Dublin here, but we need to, we need to have a point of communication that Joe's laptop can talk to Bob's, can talk to Sue, can talk to Al. Now, 
before we look at that, this is our Dublin office. You could say this is your Dublin LAN. And the LAN stands for Local Area Network. And essentially, a LAN, you can do two conditions for um, a LAN. It's a network in a confined area. find space and it's under the same administrative control such as same company so there's your two conditions network in a confined area confined space and it's under the same administrative control so you could say here this is our our office dublin let's say we just put a big building here um there we go this is your building and same area, it's in one building and under the same administrative control. So we were the company that we're selling um, phones. Yeah. Let's say we have our own website, phone.ie. Okay, so but there, there's, 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 there's a problem here at, um, straight away because Bob at the moment and Joe and Al and Sue can't communicate with each other because they have laptops all right, yeah, but there's no conduit for those laptops to talk to each other. So you go and you get a switch. I don't know if you can see me now. I just... Can you see the switch here? Yeah, see that? Yeah, great. Okay, so this is a, your switch. Your switch is your, your meet me device. All your, your, all Joe's laptop and Bob and Sue's laptop will all connect in here to one of these ports on the switch. So I know this is very, very basic stuff, guys. Some people will have been probably on networks for years. Some people are kind of more newer to this, but I have to start from the start um, so to accommodate everybody's needs. Um, so, but we will be, obviously we will be progressing through the course um, fairly quickly. And, you know, I'm sure even today we're gonna to switch off something that, that that will be sort of new information to you. So if you look at a switch, you've got lots and lots of ports. 24 ports or 48 ports or 12 ports, depending on the size of, uh, depending on how many clients that you want to connect in. But every device in your company will connect back to a port or should connect back to a port on a switch if it's hardwired. If it's not hardwired, you're going to use Wi-Fi, you're going to use an access point, a wireless access point or a WAP. Um, we we'll talk about wireless in day 11 or something like that. But for now, we're just going to look at wired networks. Assume that we're just we have a switch here, and Joe and Bob and Sue and Al are all connected into. It. Well, there's our switch. Now, what a switch looks like is. Oh, one second. It's a square or a rectangle. It's going to have an arrow to the left and an arrow to the right. Okay, there's your switch. Um, you're going to see this again, 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 again. And the definition of a switch, the sort of the, the spoke definition of a switch. Uh, switch provides communication between devices in the same, within the same network. Switch provides communication between devices within the same network. The most important word there I want you to concentrate on there is the same, the same network. If your devices are all on the same network, which Bob and Joe and Sue and Al are, because they're all on the same network, they're all in the Dublin LAN, well, then that's all they need to communicate is a switch. Don't need any other device. If we just want communication between Joe and Bob and Sue and Al, well, all you need is a switch. Why? Because they're connected into the Dublin LAN. A LAN is a network, local area network. A network is a network. A LAN is a network. And the device that provides communication between these users is called a switch. You will know a switch because of lots and lots of ports. 
Okay. Now, typically, your switch will not be in the same room as the office, or if it will be, it'll be in a it'll be in a data cabinet somewhere in the corner, and it'll be out of it'll be locked up. Because if you think about it, if somebody can get access to the switch, they can just go in and just hit the switch or unplug the, the power at the back and everybody has lost access. So typically the, the switch will be in a locked cabinet, either in the same office or it will be in a comms room. And the comms room is a room in which all of your key devices, all of your key company devices, your routers, your switches, your servers, um, are all connected into. Any questions on that, guys? No, not yet. Okay. Nope. Good, good, good. So let's go back to here, our company. Um, just delete this for a second. Move this over here. So that's kind of make, I'm just going to make, make things a little smaller here. So let's say we have Sue here and Bob. So, so we have Sue and Bob, and they're connected to switch. Okay. But the problem is. We'd like to, I'm not going to draw 20 users in here. Um, we let's say we need we 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 need a printer. Yeah, so we printer down here. Are we going to buy? Let's say we've got 20 staff. We've got 20 staff in the Dublin LAN. In the Dublin office, a LAN is an office. So we've got 20 staff. Are we going to go and buy 20 printers? So printer, 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 printer. Everybody has their own separate printer. We've got 20 printers on the, each other's desk. No, because it's not feasible from a financial point of view. And you don't need 20 printers when you can just use one because you can network the printer up. You can connect the printer up to the switch and use that for sharing resources. I'm after getting rid of the, the uh, communication and sharing resources. So we're all sharing resources. The 20 staff are all sharing resources they're sharing this printer. Okay. So we just set up our new company, selling phones. Sue and Bob and the printers connected up. And then Sue goes to type in www.google.com or Facebook or whatever. And she can't access the internet. Why can't she not access the internet? Well, if you look here, what all of the only things we have in, in here in our network and in, in our company is we've got a switch and we've got a printer and we've got two PCs. So we call it a crisis meeting. We can't access the internet. We're not going to do very well as a company if we can't access the internet. And we all call it, call it gather around. And Pablo says, Oh, I know what the problem is. I moved into a new apartment and um, the other week and I had to contact the ISP to connect oh, the ISP Ooh, internet service provider does exactly what it says in the tin so what we need to do is contact the ISP and they'll give us access to the internet so you ring up your ISP and you say hey we're a new company we're selling phones but we've no access to the internet can you give us access to the internet and your ISP will say well do you have a router and you're going to ask the ISP guy, well, what is a router? And the ISP guy will say, well, a router provides communication between devices in different networks. Switch provides communication between devices in the same network. A router moves information between devices in different networks. To look at a router, It's a circle with an arrow and going to the left and arrow going to the right. So you have your switch here is your square. Hi, Edmund, how are you? Not so bad. Good man. And your router is your circle. OK. 
Okay, definition of a switch. You can see a switch provides communication between two devices in the same network. A router A router moves data between devices in different networks. Switch, the same network, router is different networks. If there's one thing I want to use to remember today, and there's probably lots of different things I want you to remember today, is, is that, that one there. A router is the same network as switch is different networks, okay? Um, because when we start moving into more sort of complex technical things like VLANs and HSRP and VRRP and some of that good stuff, you need to kind of go back on this. You need to touch off this. What does a switch do? A switch provides communication between devices in the same network while a router is in different networks. And the reason why we need um, access to a uh, why we need a router is because Sue here wanted access to the internet. So typically, um, I'm going to start to have to delete some of this stuff. Typically, your internet will be represented by this fluffy white cloud. Let me draw a fluffy white cloud. Okay. Yeah. There's a fluffy white cloud, and that's we typically would call it the internet or the cloud. Yeah. We will look at cloud computing towards the end of the, the, the course, and the CCNA is starting to kind of go into that a bit as well. So we will do that. But for yeah, but for now, if you look at the internet, if you look at this cloud, if we peel back the layers of this fluffy white cloud, what do we see? You're going to see lots and lots of routers all connected together via cabling, all connected together. And what they will be doing is be belonging to different companies, organizations, ISPs, governments, banks, um, big tech companies will own all these, will, will all connect in, will all share information be between each other and between, between different users. So the internet is full of these routers here. You're typically, you won't see many switches in it. And I'm going to refer to your your switch is as your traditional layer. To that. I'm probably for new guys, don't worry about this. For people that are already in the know, when I when I talk about a switch, I I I, I look at the layer two switch. Is you know a layer two as for your OSI model is your traditional switch, same network. A router is your layer three device, which is different networks. And um, we can gray that area over as well. And we will be when we start looking at um multi-layer switching and stuff like that. But for the first 10 weeks of the course, switches, the same network, router, different networks, okay? To look at a router, a second. There's a router here, it's a Cisco 1841 router. Won't have many ports because you're not using many, you don't need many ports. Switch, you need lots and lots of ports. Why? Because if you've got 20 users in your office, you're going to need a switch with at least 20 ports because every user in your office connects back to a specific, a unique port on the switch. So if we look at Sue's laptop here, for example, she's going to have a connection called a NIC, and that stands for Network Interface Card. And it's just a PB, it's just a hardware peripheral. If it's a laptop, it'll be it'll be it'll be part of the the the, the motherboard. And if it's a desktop PC, it'll be its own separate NIC that you can take out and plug in and replace and stuff. Usually that's the case. But at the back of the, uh, the NIC, there'll be, you'll need a cable such as this guy here. This cable here is an ethernet cable and you will connect it from your laptop to one of these ports on your switches. And you want to do switch, doesn't care which port. And connects it, and we should make a nice little click. Now this cable is just for demonstrations. It doesn't have its nib, um, but it should make a nice little click and it connects in. Yeah. And then you're going to have one connection, one physical connection from the switch to the router, okay? 
what do you think is the most important link here that we have? Well, we've kind of got two sort of real important connections. We got a connection between the switch and the router, which is important. And then we got a connection between the router and the internet. Yeah. Individual, maybe the next one after that would be the printer. <laughs> well, it depends. It depends. If Sue is the head, is the CEO, well, her connection from the PC to the, to the switch. But really, let's say, look, look, if let's say Bob's link goes down, this this connection between Bob's laptop and the switch, yeah, who loses access? Just Bob. Bob. No one else. Okay. But if the switch, the link between the switch and the router goes down, who loses access? Everyone will know will now will not be able to connect to the internet. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Let me know if you have any questions, there, guys, at any time. Like, again, I, I, like I said, yeah, cool. Tony's using the, the, the thumbs up. Yeah, use the chat. If you have any questions at all, uh, I, I, I'm, what I do is I put people on mute just to uh, eliminate the background noise. Um, I'm not putting you on mute because I don't want you to ask questions. I'm putting you on mute just to eliminate background noise. Uh, but, you know, yeah, cool. Okay. So if we go here, the, 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 the connection to the internet moves information between devices. Um, yeah, so what happens is we got a connection here between, so let's let's just number my ports here on the router. So this is number port number one on the router, and this is port number two on the router, okay? So does it, we have a link here going on ethernet port number one back to any port on the switch, okay? Now, usually, the links between the switches and the routers, they can be copper, they can be um, fiber, but or they can be 10 gig or, or 1 gig or 100 meg, but it usually be like 10 gig um, connections. We'll talk about all that a bit later on. But here, your router will connect to your ISP. So your ISP, if this is an office in a, in, in, um, in a building, they'll already have, there'll be connections going from the outside of the building into um, your comms room and your router then will connect in to your ISP. Think about it in a house. If you're, if you're living in a house or an apartment, you are, if you're connected, you, you, you have a router, you have to have some way of connecting that router back to your ISP, whether that's going to be using cable um, or whether it's going to be using your, your, your phone line or Siri or something like that. So there has to be some connection back from your router back to your ISP. Okay, so like I said, we're doing really well as a company. We're selling lots and lots of phones and we decide to open up a new office in Cork. Okay, new office in Cork. So we have to start, I'm gonna send everybody off to Cork. Um, let me just shorten this here, here a little bit here. Move this over here. So we have a new office in Cork. So what I'm going to do is going to have the same infrastructure in Dublin as our in Cork as I had in Dublin. So uh, let's have the black font is dub. Uh, actually, no. Uh, let's say blue. I'm going to be. I'll just keep it black the same. Okay. So Cork is going to be over here. Get your Cork router. So this is your Dublin router here, this is Dublin, and this is Cork. Again, arrow left and arrow to the right, and this is, so if you see this inverted T here, okay, this inverted T represents your Cork LAN, your local area network. It's the exact same, this inverted T is the same thing as your switches and your laptops and your printers and stuff like that, okay? Network engineers are traditionally lazy. We can use shorthand wherever we, we were or wherever possible. So if you look at it here, this inverted T is the same as having your PCs, your printers all connected up. Okay, so let's say we have Al. Al is over here and he's in the Cork office and he wants to talk to Sue. Yeah. 
got a laptop. You want to communicate across with Sue. Now, if you look, Sue can communicate with the Dublin router and the internet because there's physical connections going between her laptop and the switch, and then there's a physical connection between the switch and the router. But Al is only connected as far as the router here in Cork. So what we need to do is we need to connect the office in Dublin or this router in Dublin to the, to the router in Cork. Now, what you could do is you could get a cable going to your comms room in Dublin. You get a really, really long cable and connect in and walk outside of your office and down the road and back onto the M50 and onto the M6, I don't know, the M6, the M7, the M7, or the M8. And keep going, keep going. Do you go on to the M9? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you pass Tipperary and Kildare and keep going. You get to the bottom of Tipperary. You have your Dunkettle interchange around about and eventually you get to Cork. 200 kilometers later. Can you do that? You run a cable all the way? No. Why not? Because you don't need to. Because your, again, our friend, the ISP, the Internet Service Provider, has already got cabling in situ that's already laid between Dublin and Cork. And all you have to do is ring up your ISP and say, can I have a connection, a private connection between our office in Dublin and our office in Cork? And your ISP will provide that for you. So this link here between Dublin and Cork is another connection to your ISP. So let's say our link to the internet is Aircom. The link between our Dublin router and the internet is Aircom. The link here between the Dublin router and Cork is, let's say, is Sky. They could be two different ISPs, or they could be the same ISP. What I want you to kind of get over here is that the connection between Dublin and the internet is seen as a public connection. Yeah, because you're, this is your public broadband. We can't control who has access to the internet. Here, the connection between our office in Dublin and Cork is a private connection, private link, okay? A logical private link. We are paying Sky to logically uh, reserve some space on their link just for our connections, just for our traffic between the router in Dublin and the router in, in Cork. Okay. Now, obviously, this is I'm going to say when I'm saying this logically, and um, you obviously there are, are, are there going to be other customers that are going to be using this, this these links that, uh, between Dublin and Cork, but you won't see them you won't even know they're there to you it will be your your sort of your private connection but they'll all be sky's customers and and sky will be keeping your information separate from their other customers through things like vlans and um subnets and stuff like that so okay so if we look at here at, at this this sort of diagram here, we can kind of say, how many different networks do we have altogether? How many different networks? No volunteers. Okay, so we will point them out. Well, how many lands do we have? How many local area networks do we have? Well, there's our land there, our local area network here. Here. This is your Dublin land. And we've got a Cork land. So we've got two lands. And then we've got the connection to the internet. This is what's called a WAN link. WAN, 
A WAN stands for Wide Area Network. So that's a connection to the internet, your WAN. And then we got your link down here between Dublin and Cork is also a WAN. So we got the Dublin LAN, we got the Cork LAN, we got the, the, the WAN link between Dublin and the internet, and then we got a WAN link, a private WAN link between Dublin and Cork. So we've got four different networks, one, two, three, and four. And notice what device is moving information between your different networks, the routers, because that's the job of a router. If Sue wants to talk to the printer, she doesn't need to go near the Dublin router. Her traffic will just simply go uh, here. It'll just go across into the switch, and the switch will send it out to the printer. It doesn't go near the router. Doesn't go near her gateway. Gateway is a different is a connection to a different network. Okay. If Sue wants to talk to Al down here, well, this is a different case. Why? Because then she's going to have to send information to the switch. The switch will have to send it out to the router. The router in Dublin then will have to send it out. So this will come in port number one. So let's say we've got three ports on this router here. It will come in to port number one. The router will process it and say, oh. Okay, this needs to go out port number three. Does that make sense? Sue is talking from four across the core. So here's the source and the Al is the destination. If you want to know the flow of the traffic as it goes from point A to point B, you have to first identify where is the source and where is the destination. And that will give you an idea of the traffic flow. So Sue's information, she's the source, she's sending information from her laptop to Al's laptop over here in Cork. Okay. All right. So we've got four different laptops, or four, <laughs> four different networks. Um, the definition of a WAN, we looked at a LAN, we looked at a router, we looked at a switch. These are just your basic definitions and your kind of classroom type definitions. Definition of a, of a WAN. So a WAN stands for Wide Area Network. So typically it's a network that spans over a large geographical area. used to connect multiple lands together the service is usually provided by an isp so net so a wan is a network that spans over a large geographical area so if we look at this wan here between dublin and cork that's typically it's a network that is going over a large geographical area whatever 200 kilometers and the reason why we have this WAN here is to connect multiple networks together. We have a LAN in Dublin with Sue and Bob and the printer here and everyone else that we need to connect over to the Cork LAN. We need a WAN link there because we can't run our own cable because it's illegal and it won't go very far. That's why we will use an ISP because the ISP will already have cabling dug and in situ and in place between your office in Dublin and your office in Cork. And we just pay money for them to use it. That would be a private uh, connection. Okay, guys, is that all right? Okay. Second, sorry, I'm going to see the chats there now. Sorry about that. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, good. Okay. So, yeah, so what we do with four networks, um, I had the chat there, um, it was minimized, so I can see that there. All right. Um, so, understanding the pieces of the networks. So, this is kind of, we, we talked about this. This is maybe a, need, a better draw, a better picture here. So, your PCs, you've got your PCs, you've got your servers connected into a switch. And then you got your switch connected in the router. Now, typically, your 
you got your NIC there that's connected obviously to your your your, your desktop PC there. Um yeah, you, you were spot on there, Mark, which I suppose you're right there. You have your two connect your four connections. So you got one two LANs, you got your private WAN link, and then you got your link to the internet. Yeah. Um okay, cool. Okay, so considerations that we need to use for our network applications. Okay, so when we look at your network here, we've got different considerations that will affect how healthy, how strong, how re re resilient is our network. And speed obviously is a very is is a very important consideration that is used to measure your network. Okay. Now, in order to understand speed, we need to look at actual data itself. Okay. And the smallest level of data we can have is what's known as a bit. Okay, let me just get rid of this here for a second. So let's say we have, again, let's just keep things simple here. We've got Sue here. And she's connected into a switch. And at the end of that switch is Bob. Is Sue and Bob on the same network? Yes. You have to presume that they are. Why? Because both of them are connected into a switch. Okay. Now let's say Sue has wants to send Bob a document. Okay. And in that document, there's not much written on it. It just contains her name. Yeah. S U E. Sue. Yeah. But if you look, we've got. You got your laptop here. You've got a connection, a cable, and then you got your switch, and you got a connection. How can you physically move a name, which is S U E Sue's name, across the bulb? Like I said, the road that we're using to send information is just a wire. It's just a copper wire, Ethernet connection with eight different connections. And how do we send the word Sue from poor PC across to Bob's PC? It's not like you can swallow up a word and move it across. This, these are only copper connections. So how information is moved from point A to point B is through electrical signals. And each electrical signal is Tiny signal is going to be either be a one or a zero. It's got two values, on or off, open or closed. And you can refer to them as bits. And so if we have a look here, the character S, so Sue types S in our keyboard, that her operating system will take that character S and we'll transfer it across to using ASCII text. You'll have a series of eight ones or zeros. It usually takes eight bits to make an S. So let's say, for example, in this case, Sue, or sorry, the letter S is one, 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 zero, 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 zero. So that will generate one, 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 zero, 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 zero S. So that will uniquely identify the character S. Then she types in U, okay? Now that, that can't be one, 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 zero, 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 because that's already taken up by S. So U will be something a little bit different. One, 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 zero, 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 one. E will have to be something different again. One, 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 zero, zero, one, zero. Does that make sense? And it's these ones and zeros that will get electrical signals that will get moved over and is sent across to Bob over here. This is the actual information. You're sending these ones and zeros. Now, by the way, it's the electrical signals, these ones and zeros on, on their own will not, will not be able to go over to Bob successfully. You have to add extra pieces of information, such as your MAC address, such as your source MAC, destination MAC, um, IP address, and, uh, and we'll look at all that information later on. Um, okay, so that information goes across to Bob, 
what would Bob receive? See, so Bob will receive these ones and zeros, and into his operating system will look the ones and zeros, okay? And it'll say, oh, I am, I'm receiving one, 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 zero, 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 zero. Oh, Bob will say, oh, according to my ASCII text uh, format converter, that is S. I know I'm receiving one, 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 zero, 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 one. Oh, well, that's you. One, 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 zero, zero, one, zero is E. Okay, so you're not sending sue, S-U-E across per se, you're sending what the electrical output would be referring to that. Think of it, it's kind of like Morse code. Does that make sense? Any questions on that, guys? Okay. So the basis of electrical physics, by the way, any, um, I just want to see where people are in terms of your bits and your bytes and your stuff. Just, who here, just even put in a, uh, a thumbs up on the chat there. Who here uh, can subnet? Anyone? Okay, oh, no problems here, Sergio. We'll we'll um, we we we'll, we'll um we'll we'll start again. We'll start at the very start. It's just I just want to see where people are. Um, you should have a good idea, Tony, as well of of subnetting, hopefully. Um, yeah, but again, it's subnetting is something that you'd be surprised if you go back over it. You'll it, it'll it'll it, you know it'll you might have learned it and then forgot it, but somewhere in the back of your subconscious, somewhere is is your you know, some of it will, will still be in there. It's not exactly like riding a bike. You won't be able to jump on it straight away. It might take a couple of hours before you're kind of back to, to where you were. Cool. Okay. So we go back to here. You've got your bits. A bit is your, uh, it's a counting system. A bit is a counting system for which we got two values, either one or zero. Humans, we don't like using ones and zeros because it makes up we need so many ones and zeros to make common um, um numerals um we use decimal zero to nine okay that's a it's a more it's a, it's a more friendlier uh, system for humans to use but remember computing devices don't use uh, decimal because they send their electrical signals an electrical signal can be either one or a zero. That's all they have. They've only got really something to identify two values. Okay, so a bit is a one or a zero. A byte is eight ones or zeros. One, 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 zero, 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 zero. So you've got eight bits in a byte. And like I said earlier on, a byte is usually one car. Um, a byte will usually be one character on a keyboard. Use an ASCII text. You go down, you've got 1024 bytes in a kilobyte. So as we go down, everything here is multiplied by 1000. 1024 bytes in a kilobyte, 1024 kilobytes in a megabyte, 1024 megabytes in a gigabyte, 1024 gigabytes in a terabyte. And you can see you're getting more ones and zeros. You're multiplying all this, all this time. Now, people say, oh, it's not a thousand. No, it's a 1,024. Because remember, your ones and zeros have to be exactly the same. See, when you when, when we start looking at subnetting, you're going to be doing 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Okay, you're multiplying by one, uh, by two all the time as you're moving across. Don't worry about that now. I don't want you. To, that's fine. And um, you know, and you can see if you're downloading like a, a large film, it could take it could be one terabyte in size or seven hundred gigabytes. You know, the, the 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 more you go down here, the bigger the file size. Because if you think about it, if you're downloading the latest film. Um, from 
uh, you know, or let's say you're 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 using BitTorrent, and I'm just using it as an example, um, and it's one terabyte. You know, that film, yeah, there's an awful lot of ones and zeros that will be used to make that film. Everything that you do, everything that you send over online gets converted into ones and zeros. So if you're watching Facebook or on WhatsApp or downloading a film or sending an email, everything, everything is considered or transferred to ones and zeros because it's the only thing that can move across electrical medium or coppers or fiber or even what radio waves are your ones and zeros. And when it gets to the other end, the other end will take those ones and zeros and reverse engineer it, and that will come up on the screen. Okay. Now, if we had a look at here, when we like this is your text font, ASCII text would be one 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 zero 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 zero. If you had um, um, a picture application, that one 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 zero 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 could represent the color red. Because the picture application is only about, we're going to be about colors, whereas ASCII will be about font. Does that make sense? I, hope, I don't want to kind of go too, too much into that. Um, it can be a bit confusing. So now, where does network speed come into this? Well, your bytes, your kilobytes, your megabytes, your gigabytes, your terabytes, anything with bytes is all about data storage. It's all about data storage. Your hard drive is a ter one terabyte in size. Um, is all about your bytes. Yeah. Network speed goes back to bits. Typically, bits per second. This here, MBPS, is megabits per second. So with network speed, you have bits per second. Data storage is measured in bytes. Network speed is measured in bits. How do you know the difference now? This is wrong here. Really. You should, your, your bits should be represented by a lower B, lowercase b, while your bytes an uppercase b, eight bits in a byte. So typically, when you say your broadband connection, when you hear an ad for an ISP link, they'll say gigabit connection. You know, your fiber, for example, um, fiber, uh, Syro fiber that they have is, is one gigabit connection, not one gigabyte, one gigabit. So network speed is in bits per second, data storage is in bytes. Um, Ethernet, or should I say actually fast Ethernet, the speed of fast Ethernet is 100 megabits per second. Fast Ethernet is 100 megabits per second. Gigabit Ethernet is 1024 megabits per second. Okay. So speed is important. Know that you would measure it in bits. So if somebody says, oh, I've got a, I've got my, my, my broadband link is 200 megabits. Or sorry, 200 megabytes. Tell them no, you can't just like you know it, it's 200 megabits. Okay, I'm gonna come back to delay. I'll talk about that at a different time. But delay basically is the length of time that it takes for a device to get to another device and then get back. Um, and we look at delay some other time. I'm gonna keep that later on. Availability. Availability is very very important. Okay, what do I mean by availability? Let me just do, 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 three. We've got three rulers there. I like using the rulers and circles because I can't draw very well. And by the way, my handwriting is terrible. If you've probably, probably seen that already. Um, if there's anything that I'm drawing and writing on the board, on the, using paint, please let me know. Just call me out. Um, so let's say we got Dublin here. Uh, so Dublin, Chigar, Cork, 
לא היה פעם סטופ. שכתובלן, קורק, ואנד ברפאסט. אוקיי. So, any guesses, how many different networks do we have here? Again, I'll come back to different networks. How many different networks? Remember, uh, Pablo, a router is a connection to a different network. Every link on a router is a member of a different network. So, we got a LAN in Dublin, we got a LAN in Cork, we got a LAN in Belfast. Remember these inverted, these uh, LANs represent Yeah, these are very represent a LAN. Yeah. So, yeah, Mark and Sergio is right. You got three LANs and you got two WANs. Okay. So, actually, what I'll do is. So, this is your Dublin LAN. Again, your LAN is your office, your Dublin office. This is your Cork office here. And this is your Belfast office. Your WAN links is the connection that, you're, that will you be connected to your ISP. So let's say the link between Dublin and Cork is your WAN link. So if we have Tom here in Dublin and he wants to talk to Joe, talk to Joe, um, he needs to go over his WAN link. Cool. And then we got the connection. So this router here, router, 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 router. Okay, and we got Joe in Cork and we got Al in Belfast. Okay. Now, is there any way of making this? Is there any way of optimizing this network or making this network more efficient? Like, what is wrong with this network at the moment? There's no redundancy. There's no redundancy. The layer redundancy again and again and again. Redundancy is. Failover is availability. If one link goes down, then we've no backup. So let's say here, if, we're, if Tom here is talking to Joe and we got some link, some problem with the ISP in Dublin, and the link between Dublin and Cork goes offline, well, then this information here It's not going to make its way from Dublin all the way across to Cork. It's going to get stopped. So how could you make that network better? How could we optimize this network? The connection between Dublin and Belfast. Exactly. Have another link between Dublin and Belfast. And that will give us redundancy. And it will also give us a faster network. We'll have less delay. Why? Because when our network is back up and running and we have all connections, let's say we've all connections here. If Tom wants to talk to Al, he can just go directly across between Dublin and Belfast. If we didn't have this link and Tom wanted to talk to Al, he'd have to go from Dublin to Cork, get processed by the Cork router, and then you have a delay, even that's called a processing delay, because the Cork router is going to have to inspect the information, it's going to have to strip off the source MAC, strip off the destination MAC, so you have to run, run a, like a, a, a check on the, the data to make sure that the data is not corrupted, um, and it's going to have to send the information across over here. There's a lot of things that the, the, the routers will do, Um, and that's called a processing delay. So you're going to have that extra delay here. So let's think about it, for example, if, if, you, if you refer to this as train stations and you had to get a train from Dublin to Belfast, but you had to go to Cork and then they have a stopover in Cork and then go to Belfast, you're not going to be very happy. But then they fix the link between Belfast and Dublin. And then you get a train, you just go direct between Dublin and Belfast to get there much quicker. Okay. So availability is very, very important in how you consider and how you judge the health of your network. Any questions on that, guys?
second here. Just open up the paint here again. One sec. Okay, so let's say we have this. Let's say we're going back to our office again, right? So let's say we have Al here. Al's laptop. And Al's laptop is connected to a say Cisco switch. Again, that's your universal picture of a switch. And that switch then has a connection to a Juniper router. I'll just draw a router here. Juniper are a competitor to Cisco. Let me just have sort of their biggest competitor. Then you have a connection from the Juniper router to a an Avaya router. There will be another competitor. This we can North have. Avaya. Al's laptop is a MacBook. And that via router connects to a Dell switch. Or as I said, let's say a, a HP switch. And then you got a HP switch. Then you got a connection from the HP switch to Joel. And Joel's laptop is a Dell laptop. And Dell's Joel is running Windows. Do you want to say Windows 7? <laughs> Windows 10. Yeah. Okay, so first question. How many different networks do we have on this picture? Many different networks do we have? Again, cold again. I'm going to put on my hoodie again. It's hard to regulate this office. You need many different networks. Okay. Um, remember, switches are the same network. So remember that, that, that we said. It switches a connection to the same network, okay? So let me just color in. Al here is on the same network as the switch here, this here. And so these are all the same network. So all the red circles here is the same network. Then this link here and this link are the same network. This is the same network here. And then run out of colors let's say purple this link this link this link and this link are the same network so three different networks yeah al is on the same network as the cisco switch and so the, these links here does that make sense this is all the one network let me actually just this might be easier if I do this, uh, this is one network. This is another network. This portion here is another network. And this portion here is another network. So you got three different networks. You could say this is like, let's go back. We're talking about our offices. You could say, this is the Dublin office. Ah, this is in the Dublin land. The link between the Juniper router and the Via router is your WAN link. And then the connection between the Via router and the HP switch and uh, the device over here is your Cork LAN.
So three separate networks. Okay. How many different manufacturers do we have? Got lots of different companies. Have we even named here? If you can just even name them. Okay, let's add just another one in here. Let's say Al here wants to run a Zoom call. He's got a Zoom meeting between him and Joe. Okay. How many different vendors do we have there? So let's count them. So you got one, Zoom, which is our software company for your, your meetings. Done very well over the last couple of years <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. Um, actually, all these companies have done very well over the last couple of years. Um, so you got Zoom here. Um, you got Apple. Okay, so obviously they're making the MacBook for all. You got Cisco Router. So Zoom is one, Apple is two, Cisco is three. Juniper is four. Avaya is five. HP, six. Dell laptop, seven. And Windows operating system is Microsoft is eight. So you got eight different vendors there. Eight different manufacturers. Some of these vendors are in direct competition with each other. For example, Cisco, Juniper, and Navaya would be competing at the network level for the hardware and software level for maybe the three biggest vendors. Then you'd have HP would be competing with Dell and, and Cisco as well, because HP makes switches too. But what I'm trying to say is you've got eight different vendors, you've got three different networks, and with minimal configuration, you can have a Zoom call running between Al's PC, Al's Mac, over to Joe's desktop running Windows 10. And if you think about the Zoom, what is Zoom? So Zoom is your ones and zeros, but basically my, my, my voice and my video gets changed, gets converted by Zoom into ones and zeros. And these ones and zeros will be carrying the content that will be converted across by all the devices and will be sent down to Joe over here. There's a hell of a lot of different things going on here. Some of these ones and zeros will be used by Cisco and Juniper and Avaya in order to send the information from Al across to Joe. Some devices do different things. For example, Al's MacBook was going to do something different. It was going to process these ones and zeros, these uh, these the Zoom connect the, the the Zoom bits, if you like, differently than the Cisco router, the Cisco switch, than the Juniper router. They will all do different things. They've all different jobs, and it's extremely complex. So much different stuff happening all at the same time. But it's very interoperable, it's very interchangeable. They have a different, you know, if you think about it, where, where else, it's very rare that you would get all of these competing vendors sharing information and the information has to be of a common standard, of a known standard, otherwise it's not gonna work. Had the language, that the information has to move from point A to point B from Al across to Joe has to be understood by Cisco and understood by Juniper and understood by Avaya. Like if Juniper was using a different networking scheme than Cisco, it wouldn't work. Does that make sense? So to help make this easier to understand, you divide this very complex process into seven layers. These are logical layers, theoretical layers, okay? These seven layers are called the OSI model. And the OSI model you've got your application, presentation, session, Transport, network, data link, and physical. 
Okay. Another way of saying these layers is you start down the bottom, physical layer, and you work your way up. So you have layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five, layer six, and layer seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. There's another layer that is the most complex layer, and the one that always goes wrong, layer eight, and that is the user. <laughs> but that's, you won't get asked. <laughs> the, uh, if there's an issue, it's usually layer eight. It's a layer eight issue. Yeah, the user has messed up. Okay, now, so you're, these are your OSI. This, 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 we, we'll go into this much more detail. By the way, what we normally do is we have a 15 minute break uh, or an interval between half eight and quarter to nine. And um, just so you can grab a cup of tea and just kind of just take a break and just to, yeah, just get a bit of a rest. So layer one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. If we go back, do we have that still here? Yeah. So basically what happens is we have to kind of, in order to this complex, there's so much stuff happening here. If you think about it, these Zoom call, the, you know, in order to have a Zoom call between all these different devices and they're all doing different things and they're all working with each other. You know, Cisco are working with their biggest competitor in order to move information in order for the common good. What is the common good? So Al can have a Zoom call between his Mac and Joe's Dell laptop. His Mac is running some version, some Apple iOS, and Dell's laptop is running Windows. So you got all this stuff happening. All these moving parts, these logical moving parts. They will all fit somewhere in these layers. The OSI model is also constructed in such a way that if one layer breaks, if the bottom, so start at the bottom layer, if the bottom layer isn't working, nothing above here will work. Everything depends on the bottom layer to be functioning. The bottom layer is the physical road. The, the physical in the infrastructure in which the information moves from point A to point B. So if you look here, if this link, if I went here and I cut this link here between the cable, between the Cisco router and the Juniper router, is Al going to have a Zoom call between him and Joe? No, because the cable is cut. It's impossible. The road is out. So if the link is down, if physical layer is down, everything else is going to be offline. Very important to understand that. People look at the OSI model and they get very, very confused by it. But one of the best things about it is that it's really useful for troubleshooting. And network engineers will troubleshoot as per the OSI model. For example, um, ping. I haven't looked at ping yet. Ping is a way of communication between two devices, okay? It's a troubleshooting tool. How many OS, it's, uh, it's part of a protocol called ICMP, Internet Controlled Messaging Protocol, ping, okay? It's, it's a message that says, are you there? And the other guy says, yes, responds and says, I am here. Okay, it, it sends what's known as an echo request message. Now go, and it gets a response back. So example, so ping, how many layers of the OSI model does ping test? Anyone? How far does it go? Does it test layer one? Does it road? Yeah. Does it test the data link layer? Yeah, the layer two communication thing will test layer two. So does it test layer three? Yeah. Layer one, two, and three is, if you can ping a device, you know that the physical layer is good, they can communicate layer two, they can understand each other's MAC addresses, and they can communicate layer three, they can understand each other's IP addresses. Layer one, layer two, and layer three is all operational. If you can ping a device, you've got one, two, and three, yeah? 
what if you can get an internet connection if you can get if you get a, a google.com if you type in www.google.com and that works how many layers have been tested everything everything all seven you can think about it the application so what is what operates a layer uh, of the application there applications firefox is an application so you are, you're opening up firefox and you're typing in www.google.com and you're getting a google web page well everything's working everything's working if you can ping a device but you can't get firefox you can't get the internet then that will tell you that the issue is somewhere on layer seven, layer six, layer five, and layer four. Could be an application issue. Could be that is typically these things here. In the, yeah, you, you could have a firewall that are, is blocking off. I'm going. I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, TCP ports or UDP ports or TCP port eighty, um, which would be. Um, at layer four but it's somewhere here okay so typically you know that's what you do if you if there's a link out if you're if, if you've got an outage um we'll go back to that picture here or if you've got a zoom call issue right let's say al here can't can't communicate with zoom with joe okay what are you going to do you're going to open up your command prompt here in al's pc let me just show you here command prompt and you're just going to ping Joe's PC. So let's say you ping, I don't know, ping google.com. I say ping 8.8.8.8.8.8. You get a response. Let's say this is Joe's PC is 8.8.8.8. Okay, so you were able to ping 8.8.8.8, which is Joe's PC, but you can't get a Zoom call going between your laptop and Joe's PC. That will tell us that it's something... They, they, they will tell us the road is working. Why? Because you're getting a response from Joe. You're sending this message, which is echo, and it's going across. So let's say Al here is 1.1.1.1. His IP address uh, is 1.1.1.1, and Joe's IP address is 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. So you're sending information across. It's going across. How do you know Joe's receiving it? Well, look at the response on the command prompt. You're getting a reply. So this is coming up on Al's PC. This is coming up on Al's PC. He says, I'm getting a reply here from 8.8.8.8, .8 which tells me that... Um, that da, 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 annotations... Sorry, guys, but just one second. Tells me here, I'm getting a reply from Joe. The size of the, the response is 32 bytes. It's taken 12 milliseconds to get there, and the TTL, the time to live, is 60. Now, don't worry about the TTL. I'll talk about that. So we know we can, we, we can ping. It takes 12 milliseconds to get Joe's response back. A millisecond is one thousandth of a second. So this is this is this is this is very very quick. I'm actually not pinging Joe in real life. I'm actually pinging the public IP address of one of the Google's uh, web servers. Okay. Um, so yeah, you, you get a response back, but there's an issue with Zoom. So then you have to look at okay, well, what's causing the problem here between Al's PC and why you know is it a problem? It's chances are. If, if you can ping, the network is working fine. It's just that there is, it could be somebody's PC. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Um, yeah. Let's see, go back here to the other side. So the, yeah, the functions of the OSI model. But the, by the way, OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnecting. 
Let's see, I'll try to write that down. Open systems interconnecting. Open systems interconnecting. And it was developed by the ISO, International Standards Organizations, to confuse the hell out of everybody. So the OSI is developed by the ISO. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a model that is used to uh, demonstrate the working of a network. It helps break down, these seven layers help break down network functions into different things. They do different things. Physical layer does something different to the data link layer, which does something to the network layer, which does something to the transport layer, session layer, they're all different. They have all different jobs, they have all different roles. Each role is, is used for to help for the common good, again, which is the Zoom call between Al and Joe. So if you think about it, if I have to get both of these on the same page here, um, da, 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 da. What operates at the data? What operate? What operates at the application layer? The Zoom. Zoom is what what is used to operate. So the, the the application Zoom it works here. It's a software. Zoom. This you know the, the company Zoom. They do different things to Cisco. They're not competing with Cisco. It gives structure. It gives the network structure because different devices only need to concentrate on different roles. For an example, let's let's say I'm building a house. Okay, I need to build a house, right? Okay, well, I'm going to build a house. So, what do I need to do is if I'm going to build a house? Now, I'm not, I, I don't know much about house building. So, what well, I'm going to have to build foundations. Okay. And then once the foundations are gone, there's, a, there's an order that you will use in order to build the house. You build the foundations, and then maybe you'll start building the walls. Okay, so you have your foundations, which will be going down deep. There's your foundations there. And then you build the shells of the walls, and then build the shells of the wall you need to put in the roof. You can't just build a roof without the walls. Okay. And then you're going to have to, you're, you're, you're tuning, okay? Now you're going to have to get different guys in to start doing different things. Why? You need plumbing. You need pipes coming in, plumbing. Who are you going to ask to do the plumbing? Are you going to ask the electrician to do the plumbing? No. The electrician has a different job. He's doing the electrics inside the house. You get the plumber to do the plumbing. You get the electrics to do the electricians. The electricians can't come unless... There's a bit of structure to the house. Like if you don't have any walls or the foundation is laid, you're not going to ask the electrician to come. He's going to go, where the heck is the house? <laughs> he might do a bit, but he can't do anything until, you know, he can't start putting in plug sockets and stuff until there's actually walls there. Um, well, who's going to paint the house? You're going to ask the electrician to paint the house? No, the painter paints the house. The plumber does the plumbing. The electrician, they have all different roles. It's the same with this. The Cisco switch will do a different thing than a Juniper router. A router will work differently than a switch. They do different jobs. Switches provide communication. Excuse me. Switches provide communication between devices in the same network. Routers provide information between devices in different networks. Before you look at that, you need, in terms of your exam. You do need to, uh, you should know the OSI model, the order in which it's put in, okay? And there's a mnemonic that will help you put them in the right order, okay? And the mnemonic, there's loads of different mnemonics. So this one here is all people seem to need data processing. All people seem to need data processing. Application presentation, session transfer, network data link to physical. There's other ones. Please do not 
throw sausage pizza away or there's people do need to see Pamela Anderson. There's loads of different ones. Um, just, just remember one and just stick to that one. Yeah. Again, you got your numbers. Layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five, layer six, and layer seven. The job of a switch, switch is layer two. Switch operates at layer two of the OSI model. Layer one is your physical cable. Layer three is your router. Now, if this gets a bit grayed out here, I'm going to write down your logical ports operate at your transport layer. What do you mean by logical ports? TCP port 80 is a logical port. And your application, example of applications are Firefox. Okay, so that's some of the devices. So you can see here, if we go back to our picture again, um, you got different devices. Your, your cable is layer one, your switch is layer two, your router operates at layer three. Okay, the top three layers, application, presentation, and session, is all about the data. Your data here is application, presentation, and session. What do we mean if we go back to our example here? What do we mean by our data? Well, if we want, we have a Zoom call between Al and Joe. Yeah, this is a Zoom call here between Al and Zoe. So it's jo the, excuse me, between Al and Joe. So that's Zoom data that is, Al is coming on, he's looking at the webcam and the webcam, uh, his operating system will take his, his, his video, his, take his picture and his, take his, his words and it will convert them into ones and zeros. So that's the information. That's the data. We said, one, the first thing I said earlier on when I came in, I said networking is about the movement of data from source device to destination device. In this case, what are we moving? We're moving the Zoom data from, from Al's laptop across to Joe's laptop. We're not really concerned with the data per se. We, we do need to know what it is. And um, what our job is to move it from point A to point B. It's like a courier. Yeah. Courier does does the courier really care if he's moving a Samsung TV versus a Philips TV? No, he okay, okay, he has to make sure that the the, the, the there's not fragile, but it's not going to make that much of a difference. Kind of the same thing. If we if we have a WhatsApp call here between or a Microsoft Teams between Al and Joe. The information will not change too much um, between Microsoft Teams, per se, and Zoom. In fact, the lower parts, uh, physical layer, data link layer, network layer, and here will all will, will be the same. Even the transport layer will be the same. Most, some of it will be the same. In fact, the CCNA really is these layers here. CCNA is layer one, layer two, layer three, and layer four, typically. Why? Because the, the, the application presentation session is the software. If we were doing a programming class, you might be more concerned about the layers, top layers. Okay. The way I kind of like to think about this is, let's say you have, let's go back here into this a second. Let's say you have a letter. 
and you're writing a letter to your, your Auntie Joan who lives living in London, okay? And you're using your old food cap pages, okay? So your Auntie Joan doesn't have internet access. So you're writing a letter, you go in and they say, Dear Auntie Joan, how are you? The weather is cold today. I went for a walk. I brought the dog. He stopped so many times, blah, blah, blah. And you're writing a letter across to your Auntie Joan. Now, if you leave that letter on your desk and you go and you make a cup of tea and you come back 15 minutes, that letter that you wrote, you hand wrote, is still going to be on your desk. Because it's, it's not going to magically fly over to London. You need to add extra pieces of information in order to make that letter go from your desk to your Auntie Joan. What you need to do, you need to put that letter in an envelope. You need to add a, an address, a source address, maybe, and a destination. It's very important you need the destination address because the postman in London is going to need to identify where is it going to go. You need to bring it down to the post office. So you're adding extra pieces of information onto the actual letter itself. What's the most important part? The most important part is the letter, it's the information. Okay, because if you didn't have a letter, you wouldn't need to, you wouldn't send a blank page to your Auntie Joan. That doesn't make any sense. So it's the information, it's the data. Data is just information. What are we doing over here? We're taking the information from the Zoom call and we will be adding extra pieces of information, adding extra bits of information onto the Zoom data in order to make it go from point A to point B. The switch will be looking at the layer two information. It won't be looking at the data. The switch won't care about the data. The postman, if the postman has a letter, it doesn't open up the envelope and look inside the letter. No, the postman just looks at the outside. Okay, we'll pause that there. I'm gonna uh, and I'm gonna stop recording. All right, yeah. So I was using this analogy of writing a letter and you had to add extra pieces of information. So the letter is the data, okay? The data, the, the letter itself isn't gonna go across from you to your Auntie John in, in London. You have to put it into an envelope you have to add extra pieces of thing. You know, you have to put a stamp on it. You have to have an address and um, you have to have a destination address. And then if your Auntie Joan wants to respond back, she's to do the exact same thing. Well, that's what the OSI model illustrates. You've got your data, which is generated by your application presentation. It's the, the, the three layers here. And then the transport layer adds extra pieces of information onto it. It gives it to the network layer, it adds extra piece of information onto it. It gives it to the data link layer, adds extra piece of information onto it. Then the physical layer takes all of this information and it sends it out to the physical cable. Okay. So we'll just have a look at a flyby example of what each layer does. Again, we have documents on this, so I have a tutorial on it as well. So your application, start at the top, layer seven. Application is what the user will interact with the application. So this means that if you want to go to Firefox, if you want to, you know, if you want to open up Internet Explorer, what you need to do, you need to, you need to go to the appropriate application in order to, to do what you need to do. You want to play a movie, you open up VLC Media Player or something. You know, um, so you need the correct application in order to provide you with access to those apps. OK, the application layer and the presentation layer are closely linked. So they lead the, the layers. They work very closely beside each adjacent layer. 
So the application will work very closely with the presentation layer, which will work very closely with the session layer and the transport layer will talk to the network layer and the network layer will talk to the data link layer and the data link layer will talk to the physical layer. So if you look at these, so in examples of applications, if we look at, let's say, our applications, Firefox, which is an internet browser. And what other, other ones? Microsoft Word. Yeah. Adobe. Adobe Acrobat. Then the next layer is the presentation layer. Like I said, these two talk to, to each other very closely. The application, the, the, the information generated by the application has to be put, has to be presented in a format that the application can understand. So if it's internet, for example, it has to be in a format that Firefox can understand, such as HTML. If you're opening a Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word is going to have to open up the format which will be dot doc. If it's Adobe, maybe it'll be a PDF. So different applications are used to open up different files, depending on the format of the file. For example, you're not gonna use Firefox to open up a .xls file, because it's not gonna work. You need Microsoft Excel in order to open up the .xls, okay? .xls is the format in which the information is in. Excel is the application in which you will run it. I'm sure you've all, I'm sure you've all seen or downloaded a file sometime and you went to open it up and, and it, it, doesn't, it says Windows cannot file an application suited to open it up and you have to go browsing. You look at the file extension and go, oh, okay, and then you look for an app online that you can use to open up that piece of information. Any type of communication is called a session, okay? The session layer's job is to start and end the session. What are we talking about here? We're talking about our Zoom session here, or communication. You'll have lots of different sessions between Al here and Joe. So it's the session layer's job is to start and end the session, and as well, keep the sessions separate. Okay, manage the sessions. Now, how does it keep the sessions separate? By putting in what's known as port numbers. Okay, and the port numbers job, like I said, the top three layers is about your application presentation session. This is about your data. So what are those? Just this is your data here. Okay, the transport layer defines how the information can be sent. We'll look at this probably a little bit today, um, maybe tomorrow as well. So information can be sent two ways. They can be reliable or unreliable, okay? Reliable has a specific set of protocols called TCP. The TCP protocol operates at layer four, which is transport layer. If it's unreliable, it's UDP. Okay. And depending on the information will dictate whether you want the information to be sent to be reliable or unreliable. Reliable means anything that is lost or broken or corrupt gets resent. It's reliable. Like it's like you order something from Amazon. If it doesn't get there or it's lost in the post, you're going to ring up Amazon and say, I didn't get it. And they'll send out another, your, your product again. Unreliable is if it's lost or doesn't get there, well, it's not going to resend it. Best effort. It doesn't resend anything. And I'm going to talk, we'll go into more detail. 
uh, excuse me, okay? So data is sent either reliable or unreliable, depending on the application. Excuse me, I'm the smother here with a cold. Um, it's kind of good we're doing this in no Zoom. People are going, Jesus. Um, no, it's definitely not COVID, but it's uh, just, just a bad cold. Uh, okay, the ports. We have well, the transport layer defines as port numbers on to the data. Okay, so you have the data here. Okay, and let's think about the data being our fool's cap pages that we talked about. In the case that we were using earlier on, the data is your Zoom call. Yeah. So your Zoom data is your ones and zeros that contain your voice and your video that you want to talk across. So there's your Zoom data. All right. So the transport layer will add in what's known as port numbers, okay? You'll have a source port number. Let's say is 1050, and you'll have a destination port number, okay? Now, let's say, uh, okay, what I'll do is, let's say we're not, let's say we're browsing. I wanna just to keep things simple. Let's say we're not using Zoom. Let's say we're going on to the internet, okay? So earlier on, this here, Al here is talking to Joe. Let's say Joe is not a Zoom call anymore. Let's say Joe, this is a web server. Okay, this is Google. Google.com. Yeah. So he wants to get a web page. So the, 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 it's not Zoom data, it's going to be H, HTTP request. Uh, HTTP get message. Okay, so the source of so so the here. So basically, where are we here? The transport layer. The transport layer adds a source port number. Okay, it's a logical port number. The source port number is used to keep the session separate. You got a source port number. You got a destination port number. This is added on to the actual data. The data is you sending a message across to Google saying, "Hey Google, can I get a HTTP message from you?" I'm sending it, can I get a, a web page from me? Okay, so the source port number is 1050. The destination port number will be 80 or 443. Usually it's more nearly always 443. We'll keep it at 80 at the moment, okay? This HTTP information is that you're sending across to Google is considered TCP. It's reliable. That means if this message here doesn't, get across to Google or is corrupt, then I'll resend it, okay? So this is TCP. So this is what the transport layer does. It adds your source port number, adds your destination port number, defines your well-known port. TCP port 80 is very well known. It's one of the, it's one of the it is the most well-known port number, logical port number. Now you got other things, you got uh, TC, uh, TCP port 80 is HTTP. Uh, TCP port 443 is HTTPS, SSH is 22, Telnet is 23, FTP is 21, um, SMTP is 25. There's lots of, you don't need to know many of them. Okay, so after the transport layer, add this extra piece of information. Again, think of our, think of your, what you do when you're sending a, a letter to Andy John. You add extra pieces of information and you do it in, a, in, a, in an order. You write your letter and then you put the letter into an envelope and then you put a stamp on the letter and then you put your address. So yeah, there's an order in which, which you do it. So the order here is the same. Well, not the same, but it does, it's followed in a, in, in a similar kind of orderly fashion. Your, applica your, 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 your application is sending this information 
and then it goes down the OSI model to the transport layer. The transport layer adds on this information. Then it passes to the network layer. And it'll say, hey, network layer, add your logical addresses, your, such as what's known as your IP address. So the network layer will add the source IP address of the user. Okay. Well, let's say the source IP address, S is for source, would be 192.168.1.1. IP address, logical address. Destination address, Google. Let's say 8.8.8.8.8. Destination is 8.8.8.8. Want to Google. Source port. 1050, destination port, 80. <laughs> okay. The, what, what, what do we say the router here operates at layer three? This is layer three, network layer. So what does the router use? The router uses IP addresses to find the best path to your destination, which in this case is google.com, which is 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Once the network layer is finished, it gives it to the data link layer. The data link layer has a different address. You've got two different addresses. You've got a MAC address, which is your physical address, and then you have your logical address, which is your IP address. So you're going to have a source MAC. Source MAC is going to be, let's say, A, 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 A. And your destination MAC address is going to be, let's say, B, 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 B. Now, by the way, I'm being very lazy here with this. I just, I'm running out of space. But a MAC address is 12 hexadecimal address. 12 hexadecimal address. A hexadecimal address goes from zero to F. So you got 16 different characters. Zero to F. Binary is one or zero, two values. Decimal is zero to nine, which is 10 values. Hexadecimal is zero to F. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, which is 16 values. Okay, the switch operates at layer two, which is the MAC address. Now, the other things that it does on here, the ones what's called an FCS frame check sequence, I don't, you know, I did, and there's there's a CRC here, um, there's TTLs, there's, there's lots of information, more extra information. I want to keep things as simple as possible. Um, all of this information is now finished. This is where the physical layer will take all of this information and convert it into ones and zeros, which is your electrical signal, and it'll send it down the link. Send it to the next device, which would be switch what will the switch look at in this case let's have a look uh well here we go what will the switch look at the switch will not or will not need this switch here won't look at the ip address the only thing that the switch will inspect is sorry, this the mac switch will look the source mac address and destination mac address and say oh yeah i need to send it across over here the router will get it. It will look at the IP information, source IP address and the destination. Actually, the router will do things on the layer one, two, and three. The switch only looks at layer two. The router will look at layer one, two, and three. It needs to understand layer one, two, and three. The switch will only look, understand layer two. Switch won't look at IP information. That's the job of the router. Is there any questions on that, guys? Okay, let me show you. Uh, I wonder if maybe I'm going to simplify things a little bit here. Let's say we've got two users. Or, and I'm going to put them on the same network. 
OK， so 有教，谁？嗯 ，Bob， 你教。Bob is here, and Joe is here. All right. Actually, no. This is going to be a server. Sorry. This is going. To, I'm going to change this to be a server. Uh, this is a web server. This is the in, intranet. Okay. This is internal. Okay. You have a switch here. So when you see a switch, you know that the server here is on the same network as Bob because switches provide communication between devices in the same network. Okay, this is server. Okay, the IP address of Bob is 192.168.1.1. The IP address of the internet is 192.168.1.5. Okay, Bob is sending a message. He's gonna contact the, uh, the inter uh, internet looking for a web page. Source MAC address is AAAA. Destination MAC address is BBBB. So Bob goes onto his PC and he opens up a web page and he says dub 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 dot. I he doesn't. He goes. He just types in the IP address of the web server. Yeah. So a page is going to be built. Uh, and this will be. Actually, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. So here, this is the data. So this will be your HTTP get message, which is sent from Bob, okay? So there's your data. Your data is your top three layers, which is your application presentation session, okay? This is Bob. Now, what will happen is the transport layer will take this and add on the source port number. Let's say the source port number is randomly generated. Let's say it's 1050. The destination port number, because it's a HTTP GET message, will be TCP port 80. Because HTTP is a TCP protocol, you know, they'll have a TCP uh, window added on, a segment on here. Then the network layer will add your IP address. So the source IP address, as a source, will be 192.168.1.1. The destination IP address will be 192.168.1.5. Then it'll be the job of the MAC address layer, which is the data link. Okay, so it's going down. So the data link will add in your MAC details. Source MAC address. One second. In red, it's going to be A, 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 A. Destination MAC address is going to be B, 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 B. Okay, that's you know, this is limited information, but this now is enough for to go across to the switch. The switch will see this. The switch will not look at this information here or this information. It only looks at the red font. And it goes, oh, you're going to BBBB. That's the MAC address of this here. I'd send it out. So let's say this is port one and this is port three. Physical port one on the switch, physical port three. These are logical ports. So it's completely different. So the switch goes, oh, I need to send this out physical port three in order to get the internet server. I'll talk about that next week, how it all does that, how it switch, switches. Okay, it goes across to the internet server, and the internet server says, oh, this is Bob looking for a web page. I'm a web server. I'm going to respond back with a web page for Bob. Okay, 
And what happens? Let's paste in here. This is the response back. Now, I'm, I'm going to be lazy here. So this is the this response back. And the response back, so, some information is going to change. So it's not going to be HCP get, it's going to be HCP response. So the web server is responding back. With a web page. The source IP address will be 192.168.1.0. See, it gets flipped over. 1.5. Destination IP address will be 192.168.1.1. The source port will be 80. The destination port will be 1050. This I want to show you about the source, the, uh, the response back. So the source port will be port 80. The destination port will be 1050. The MAC address information will also be flipped because you're going back from the internet web server. So the source MAC address of the internet server is B, 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 B. And the destination MAC address is going to be A, 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 A. So, okay, any questions on that, guys? The reason why we use the source details, source port number, destination port number, is when this response back comes back into Bob, Bob's operating system would say, oh, 1050. Ah, I'm able to, Bob's operating system is able to piece this HTTP GET message with this response. Why? It can match TCP 1050. It sent this request on 1050. It's getting the response back on 1050. Then, so let's say Bob wants to send another session across to the internet server. The next port number is going to be in increments. It's in sequential. 1050, it'll be 1051. The response back will be 1051. The next message will be 1052, 1052. Let me show you that. See this. Okay, I'll open up a fire. Let me just open up a web page here. Okay. And uh, let's Google. Okay. Let me just open, I'm gonna open up a few web pages here. One second. Let me uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So I got Google, I got independent, and I got the journal, okay? So I got the three web pages open up here, right? Google, Google, independent, and I got the journal, right? Now I can go in here into Netstat on my operating system, on my command prompt, and I can type in Netstat space minus A. And it's showing me, actually, we'll do a minus n. That's better. Minus a shows me too much information, shows me DNS resolution. It shows me all my connections. So you can see here, I'm communicating across with, with, with so you have your TCP. My, my source IP address is 192.168.1.178.27. And you got my source port. Whoever I'm communicating across, in this case, is 18.184.229.26, port 443. So I'm sending a message out. This is my source IP address. This is my source port. This is my destination IP address. This is my destination port. Then that device 
I have established a TCP session, this device then will send me back a message. Now this, I don't know, this could be here or it could be on the journal.ie, it could be anywhere. I don't know. Source IP, source port. Destination IP, destination port. Any questions on that, guys? So, so let's say the, the site responds back to you, you would see some message coming back there. Would that be right? Yeah, my operating system, like this is all transparent to me. We don't, like we don't see this in the background. Like I can show you uh, this. One second, Let's see if this works. I'm just doing this on the fly now. I don't know whether this is going to, to work. It hasn't been set up. Let me just, just check. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, let me just do this again. Okay, okay, there we go. So I just refreshed uh, the independent there, yeah? Okay, I just re refreshed it there. Okay, so I go back in here, I wanna see, and that's a minus N. Okay, so I should have established the connections here across. Now I'm running here in the background, Wireshark, okay? Wireshark is a packet snipping tool I have on my laptop. And I should see some sort of TCP connections between me and independent. So here, source IP address 192.168.178.27, destination 134.224.101.186. Let's see if we can see this here. One, three, four. Uh, one, three, four, two, two, four, one, oh, one. Three, four, two, two, four. Oh, I should have been there. Okay, that's there must be some sort of a lag anyway between them. But yeah, you put you probably this is Wireshark will show you more information. So you can see here, this is your my data here, transport layer. Okay, the source port. The destination port source ip address the destination ip address the source mac address here the destination mac address so i'll show you your, your your details um if i was to recapture again you see this is what's seen and where is all this what's all this information being captured now at the moment using udp where am i going to ah i know what this is Anybody have you, anybody? The Zoom call. What's that? The Zoom call. This is the Zoom, yeah, this is the Zoom. I'm communicating with this Zoom web server, or the Zoom server, use, using the protocol UDP. So all my ones and zeros are being sent across. My source IP address, 192.168.178.27. Destination is, this is the, a Zoom subnet. And you can see it, and it's using UDP. So UDP is unreliable. So when I send this across, then Zoom will respond back to me. Let's see. Uh, you, can, you can see some responses coming back. So I'm sending this on destination port 50462. And as you can see, this is the port number matches. So the port numbers are used to help keep track of the sessions. I'm sending it across on one port number. I'm getting it 
on the port number so I can match this. So Bob can match, Bob's operating system is sending it on 1052, goes across to the web server. This web server will respond back to it on 1052. He can piece this packet here with this one here. All right. Okay. By the way, anyone interested, Wireshark is completely free. Um, I would recommend you, you, uh, you can download it and you can install it on your laptop. And it shows you all packets coming in or all packets going out. It's very, very useful for understanding the structure of packets um, and all of information. So we talked about this before. We had your three layers, your top three layers, which is your data link layer. Your sesh, so here, your here is just going to like this. Your transport layer. So what happens? You have, as we, we talked about this, you, you have different things that happen at different layers. Yeah, the data link layer is, is generated by these three layers. Then the transport layer adds port numbers on. When the transport layer is given, adds the port number on, the data gets changed to a segment. Segment is what is used after the transport layer adds its port number on. Then it gives it to the network layer. What does the network layer do? It adds your IP address, your source IP address, your destination IP address. It becomes known as a packet. This is These are just terms that are used to identify the process at, which, at each layer of the OSI model. The data link layer then adds it on your MAC address. Source MAC address, destination MAC address, it gets known as a frame. Anything that happens in frame is layer two. All of this then gets converted into ones and zeros called bits. This process is called data encapsulation. adding extra pieces of information onto the data in order to make it go from point A to B. Another mnemonic, with lots of mnemonics in networking. Don't sum people fry bacon. Data, segment, packet, frame, and bits. Okay, any questions on that, guys? So. Give me one second here. Yeah, so we got the OSI model. We also got another model called the TCP IP. TCP IP, so these models are, these are theoretical models that are used to illustrate how information moves from point A to point B. The OSI model is more common because it just divides it into more pieces, seven pieces, seven layers. While the TCP IP was invented by, or was, is used by the American DOD, Department of Defense, and has four layers. But they all they correlate. Your application presentation session correlates directly with the application layer. Transport is the OSI. Transport is also transport in the TCP IP. It's called network in the OSI. It's called internet in the TCP IP. And data link and physical layer is encapsulated in the one layer using your network access. TCP IP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. Okay.
That's the stuff there. Um, we will look at where are we on this? Yeah, we've done the OSI model. IP address. Okay. We'll come back into uh, this more detail. Your IP address. If I'm after writing it a couple of times. It's four numbers. Each number is separated by a dot. Okay. Each number is called an octet. Okay. For example, here, one seven two dot thirty dot five dot eighty two. Okay. The IP address. It operates at layer three of the OSI model, which is your network layer. Always combined with a subnet mask. Okay. For now, subnet mask is either a two five five or a zero. When you have a subnet mask, now this will change when we start looking at subnetting. But for today, 255 in the subnet mask is the network part of the address. Zero is the host part. What do we mean by host? A PC is a host. A server is a host. So let me just take this again. Actually, what I'll do, uh, let me introduce Packet Tracer to you. Um, by the way, if you want to find out your IP address, you can just go in to command prompt on your laptop if you're using Windows and type IP config space forward slash all. And there you're going to have your details. So you can see here, this is the IP address from my laptop. It was given to me by what's known as process called DHCP, which we'll talk about that. Um, and the IP address is 192.168.178.27. The market, uh, the subnet mask is 255, 255, 255, which means that the subnet mask tells me that this PC is in the 192.168.178 network and it's host number 27. 255 represents the network part of the address. Zero represents the host. So it's easier kind of like doing, doing, doing it here. The 27 is the host. Okay. You can change your IP address on your PC by going into... Lee. Yeah. Um, in the subnet mask, at times where, when I'm out on the road and I'm trying to ping a piece of equipment, I'm told to use 255, 255, 255, dot two two four right that's a different subnet mask mm, yeah but it, could, could, we, could, could, we, could we not just use two five five two five five two five dot zero and we still get the same two two okay so two five five two five five two five five zero will cover two hundred and fifty four mm. ip addresses a two two four address subnet mask will only cover it narrows it down addresses. it narrows it down i see right okay it makes your, your network much smaller. Right. Um, yeah. And we'll be talking about that. We'll, we'll, we'll go into them that much more detail when we look at um, subnetting. Okay, cheers. Thanks. So here is, if you want to change your IP address manually, I go into control panel, go into network connections, and I can do it here. Right click. Um, so I'm using Wi-Fi. This is my, my wireless router. And I go into properties. And I can go into here, IPv4 properties. And you see here, my, my default option is to get an IP address from DHCP. But I can change that and I could use a manual IP. Now, I'm not going to do it, obviously, because if I do it here, what's going to happen? I'm going to lose everybody. Where's Lee gone? Because I kicked myself off the network. So I'm not going to do that, um, obviously, because things go blind go. Oh, there's a, there goes a Zoom call. Uh, all right. Um, okay, so let me show you Packet Tracer. Packet Tracer is an app. Now you can install it 
I, I, um, well, actually, I don't worry about tracker tracers tonight. We'll talk about it tomorrow um, installing it. Uh, da, 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 one second. Just give me a second here, guys. I'm just doing something here. So I'm going to use packet traces just to, to illustrate what's about. It's just logging in at the moment, just giving me problems with them. Um, just logging in here. Uh, where are we going here? One sec. Sorry, one second. Um, actually, we won't. I'll, 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 I'll give a presentation on Packet Tracer um, tomorrow. Let's say we've got two PCs here. Oh, that's working now. Is it? I continue as guest. So I do have a login, I just can't remember it. Um, it's been a while since I used Packet Tracer. Um, so it's just, what are you doing? Ah, there we go, okay, cool. So we got in. By the way, Packet Tracer is free um, and it's very, very useful for building networks and very useful for getting used to the, the command prompt and stuff like that. So I'm gonna get a PC, I'm gonna get a switch and I'm gonna get another PC. When we start doing labs, from we're not gonna be doing much labs like normally why Wednesday will be our kind of day we'll, we'll be doing labs but tomorrow will definitely it'll be more theory because I need to there's quite a lot of theory I need to cover with you first um, um, so but we will then use Wednesday evenings the hour for labs and doing stuff in packet tracing and stuff so let's say I want to have a PC here okay I want to give this an IP address so I'm going to give this PC an IP address of 192.168.1.1 now, this is Packet Tracer. This is not my PC here. Like, this is a PC within the application of Packet Tracer. So I'm not giving my physical laptop this IP address. This is a laptop within Packet Tracer. I'm going to give it to someone at mass 255, 255, Okay. Why did I not take that there? 192.168.1.1. One dot one two five two five two five zero. Okay, where's that gone? It's there, but it's kind of grayed out. You can see just a gray box. Isn't it? It's it's like right below the laptop. <laughs> right, that I can't see it at all. And um, so yeah, I, I what I do is I'm gonna go in here. I'm gonna give it. This IP address, 192.168.1.1. And you can see the subnet mask 255.255.255.0, 255, 255, yeah? And this one here, I go in here, go to desktops. This is 192.168.1.2. And 255.255.255.0. Okay. Um, and again, 192.168. Right, I can't, yeah. Anyway, um, I can write on this. Let me draw on this here. Uh, so draw on, okay, so let me draw. So this laptop here has the IP address of 
192.168.1.1 and subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. This laptop over here, 192.168.1.2, 255.255.255.0. Two five five zero. So we the on, the only thing the subnet mask does is it divides the IP address into the network part and the host part. Okay, so that's all it does. So the IP address here is one nine two one six one dot one, and it it kind of draws a like a red line to separate the host part from the network part. So this is host number one in the one nine two one six eight one network. This is host number two in the 192.168.1 network. 255 equals network, zero represents the host. Any questions on that? So I can get these two guys and I can connect in, connect the cable going into any part of the switch, doesn't matter. And any port here on the switch. Okay. Uh, let's fast forward time. Okay. Now I can take test it out. We're going in and running ground prompt and pinging the other device. So I'm pinging one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot two. See, and I'm getting a response back. Now if I went into this PC over here. And I change the IP address to 192.168.2.2. Would that work? No. So this guy here, 192.168.1.1, and this guy here is a 192.168.2.2. Let's see if this works. Thing 192.168.2.2. No. Sign out. Why? Because they're on different networks. This guy here is on the 192.168.1 network. This guy here is on the 192.168.2 network. What do we have here in the middle? We have a switch. Switches provide communication between devices in there. Same network. If we wanted these two PCs to talk to each other, we'd need a router. Okay. Now what I then? Okay. So let me do something here. So we're going to keep the IP address. And um, one nine two one six eight one dot one and one nine two one oh sorry I'm just lines uh one nine two one six eight no two dot two wasn't it yeah two dot two now if I was going to change the sub let's change the subnet mask to two five five two five five zero dot zero. Okay, I need to change IP details. Uh, here, I'm going to go in again into 192.168.1.1.255.255.0.0. And here, 255.255.0.0. Now, will they work now? Yeah. So will I be able to ping 192.168.2.2? Yes. But I wasn't able to ping earlier on. Well, you've changed you've changed this subnet mask. Subnet mask, yeah. I've changed the subnet mask. If you look here, 
where is our red, where's our divider? Where's our, our network, uh, our, 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 our divider line? Our red yeah. line has been- At the end of 168. Yes. So this PC here is where? It's in the 192.168 subnet. Mm -hmm. Stop there. This PC here, is it the one is one two one six eight subnet. Mm -hmm. Both of them are in the same network. They we know they're in the same network because the two five five the subnet mask tells us so. So this should work. Just ping it. There we go. So the subnet mask is very very powerful because it can make devices that you think are in the same network. It can put them in different networks. Like it was a gray mask earlier on with 255, 255, 255, 0 during the same network. And then all of a sudden they change the subnet mask to 255, 255, 255, 224, and they're in completely different networks. Mm -hmm. um, and don't worry about the 224 stuff. That's, that's with, I'm not, I, I can't possibly talk about that now. I don't have time. And um, it's just, yeah, there's too much stuff going on. Well, if you're if you're carrying a, a ping test and you have your you have the IP address and you have the subnet mask, do you need the default gateway as well, or can you? If I have a router, like here, router. we don't need a default gateway. Pardon? I'm not going between. I'm not going. Uh, to yeah. you're going from switch. You're going. You're going from switch, but going through the router, you, 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 you will need a default gateway. Hundred percent. You will right. not be able to communicate with a device in a different network if you don't have a default gateway installed. If you're on the same network. If you're on the same network, you don't need a default gateway. Okay. A gateway is exactly what it says on the tin. It's mm. a gateway, it's a way to go to a different network. Your default gateway is always, no exceptions, loads, yeah, we have loads of exceptions in, in networking. This is not one of them. Default gateway is always your IP address of your router, of your, your routing device. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, if I need to go to the to a different network, I need to have this default gateway installed. If I don't have it installed, I'm not going to go to a different network. Now, for communication between these two devices, we don't need a default gateway because we're not going out. Sure. To the yeah. We're communicating on the same switch. The, you know, and without without complicating things here, right? We should, we, we should even be talking about this now. The switch here won't even look at the IP information. Switch doesn't know what an IP address is. The only thing the switch will do is look at the MAC address. Now, I'm just probably confusing for people that are new to networking. I will explain that in much more detail next week. Okay, um, switches are layer two devices. Switches don't inspect IP information. Switches only inspect MAC addresses. Okay. All right, so we got the IP. Okay, let me look at this. Transport layer. We said earlier on, transport layer defines how information is sent. Information can be sent two ways. It can send either reliably or unreliably. Reliably or unreliably. Now, in, a, in order to talk about what reliable is and what unreliable is, or in order, before we talk about what TCP and UDP do, we need to look at the definition of reliable versus unreliable. Okay, so what what does what do we mean by reliable? I'm gonna write this in because it's quite important. And um, so reliable equals any information that is lost or corrupt during transit gets re-sent. That's reliable. 
any information that is lost or corrupt during transit gets resent. Unreliable, obviously, is doesn't get lost, uh, doesn't get resent. Is best effort. Okay, so I go and I buy a TV of Amazon. Okay, and if that TV doesn't come. I ring up Amazon and I say, look, I got a TV, none came, no one came. And they say, apologize, and they send me a new one. And they resend it. Okay? Because that's reliable. You know, if Amazon wasn't reliable, I wouldn't be purchasing a TV from them. I, you know, I want to be, I want, when I buy something, a TV, I want to make sure I get it. And I don't want it broken. So if Amazon was sending me a TV and I open up the box and I turn it, plug it in, and there's nothing coming up on the screen, well then, I'm going to ring up Amazon and say, this is broke, it's corrupt, can you resend me another TV? And they will, and they'll apologize, because it was DOA, dead and arrival, yeah. That's reliable. That's like the TCP protocol. Unreliable, okay. Unreliable is best effort, if you get it well and good. Let's say I go traveling out to, Mali in Africa and I go visiting Timbuktu and I decide to send my auntie who lives in uh, Honolulu uh, a postcard from Timbuktu right to uh, remote locations kind of um, and the postcard doesn't I send it from the post office in Africa to Hawaii and my auntie doesn't get it. And I come back home to Ireland, to Dublin, and I ring my auntie and say, did you get that postcard I sent from Timbuktu? And she said, no, I didn't get that. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna draw, am I gonna fly back to, to Africa and resend her the postcard? No, I'm just gonna go, oh, well, tough. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm not gonna resend the postcard if she didn't get it, best effort. I hope to get there. If it didn't get it, I'm not gonna do anything. Does that make sense? Just to kind of try to put in a kind of, you know, a real world kind of uh, an, an analogy to explain the tool. So why why would why won't why wouldn't most companies? Obviously, when you were on the Wireshark there, you're looking at the Irish Times and different things, and a lot of them were coming back as UDP. Why wouldn't most of them use the TCP? Okay, great question. Uh, <laughs> right, because UDP is much faster. Yeah, UDP is much faster, TCP is much more reliable. So what do you want? Do you want reliable or do you want fast? Well, it depends. If I'm downloading a movie from the web page, if I'm downloading a movie um, from BitTorrent, for example, right? And it's like, let's say it's, it's one, let's say it's 700 men, Let's say it, it, it's one gigabyte, right? And it's a, it's the Avengers. I want to make sure that I get every single pixel on every bit of sound, everything. And if there's anything that's that's that, if I don't get any picture picture or anything like that, I want it all sent. And I want the movie will not finish downloading until everything, every pixel, every one, every bit is in its proper place, ready for me to play that movie. That's reliable. Or if somebody's sending me the wage, if somebody's sending me bank account details or money over bank link, you want that to be reliable, don't you? You don't want an extra, well, probably you do want an extra zero added on to your to, to the money, but you don't want you you don't you don't want someone a, a zero to go missing. That's reliable. So, like, um, do you ever watch? Try and watch a uh, try and download something from the internet and stop it when it's at 98% and try and watch it. It's unwatchable, you can't watch it because it's not finished every putting everything back together. So then, so you can see the case for reliability, yeah? Mm, yeah. Why would you use one, why would you use UDP? For speed. For speed, for speed. Yeah, exactly. And, why would you use speed then? Why is why would speed be so important? Because when you're using live communications, 
you can't afford to wait for information that is lost to be resent. Like I'm doing Zoom here. Let's say some of my conversation that I'm talking about gets lost in transit. I don't want the application to resend that because I'm live. Because then it's going to it's going to actually corrupt our conversation. Yeah, it's better off it being dropped completely. You can see so so how you how you know whether an application is using TCP versus UDP, you just remember the UDP segment. Any live, um, any application that uses live material is unreliable. UDP. WhatsApp is unreliable. Why? Because it's live. Because you're communicating with a live human being somewhere else. You uh, Zoom. We're all communicating together right now. So right now, this instant, you know, in the moment is UDP. And if you're watching a Premiership game that's streamed, that's UDP. If you're playing uh, Call of Duty with somebody hosting um, on a server, um, that's UDP because you're shooting around. You don't you don't want a bullet that you shot. Um, I'm going to exaggerate this. You don't want to you don't want a bullet that you press you know on on your on, on, on the gun to to be resent like a, a second or two later because it's no good because you know you're moving at the, the mad speed you could have ended up killing one of your friends or something you know so anything live is UDP TC for everything else just TCP for everything else is Mastercard TCP covers everything else UDP is more sensitive. UDP information, live information is more sensitive to delay. So because it's live, it comes up much clearer if there's any delay in the network. You ever have a WhatsApp call between you in Dublin and your friend in Sydney, Australia? I don't know. You notice that you can't really talk at the same time. You have to do this sort of informal wait. You say your piece and then you're gonna wait two seconds. And then the other person says their piece and they kind of wait. Because you think about it, how long does it take for your video and your voice to go from Dublin across to Australia? You know, and then come back again, he's to respond back. You know, what, how, how, what are like 18,000 kilometers or I don't know what it is, but it's a long way away. You know, and we just take it for granted because we're spoiled. But if you have a WhatsApp call between you in, let's say, Blanchardstown and your friend in Tala, you won't, it'll be more streamlined. Does that make sense? Sometimes you see it as well. Um, if there's a, <coughs> excuse me, if, <coughs> excuse me, there's a, if there's a news segment, let's say there's an earthquake in Italy and you have Bob and Sky. And he's reported out to Rome. And he's talking, he says, hi, he's talking back to London. And he's saying, hey, Kate, this is Bob out here in Rome. And uh, things are really bad here at the moment. And the girl in London says, well, can you explain what, what's happening, Bob? And Bob's like, yes, Kate, as I said, you know, because you can see that there is a delay between the person in London, in head office in London, talking to someone out in the field out in Rome, for example, because it has to bounce off the various satellites. So UDP is time sensitive. If there's any sort of delay on your network, it's going to affect uh, real-time information much quicker. Uh, it's going to go much more than, than something like TCP. That's why you have what's known as, that's why you, you create um, quality of service, quas on your network to give UDP uh, traffic more priority or a higher priority than you would TCP. Because you're not, you won't notice if it takes an extra second or half a second for a web page to load. But you will notice if the half a second is on a phone call. So how do they work? Well, UDP just sends information. 
There you go. Have you got it? Have you got it? Have you got it? Have you got it? TCP, you have what's known as a three-way handshake. Okay. So before any information is sent, you have to build a three a three-way handshake between the source device and the destination device. So we've got a source device here, 10.1.1.1, and we've got a destination device here is 150.1.1.1. So the source device, before the actual data takes place, you send, source device sends what's known as a SYN message, S-Y-N. And basically this means, are you there? It's going from the source device. The destination device will respond back by sending a SYN ACK. SYN, SYN ACK. SYN ACK is basically, I acknowledge your SYN message. I received, I have received your SYN message. I acknowledge receipt of that SYN message. Does that make sense? So like, it's yes, I'm here. And then a source device sends another message called an ACK. Okay, which basically establishes your TCP connection. So only then can you send information across. So now we have this TCP connection happening between those two devices. And then you can send the data. So once you're, you're so your TCP is like a tunnel that is built between your source device and your destination device, and the tunnel, the, the connection will not be established unless you have your three-way handshake. The three-way handshake is the formal way of setting up the communication. Once the communication has been set up, then you have your established connection, and then you can actually send information. So then you'll start sending your information. The information that you sent has to be acknowledged. How do you, if you're sending information, right? You have established your TCP connection. How do you know if the device has actually received it? It has to send an acknowledgement that I've received it. Okay. So we have the established connection is already established. We've done our three-way handshake. We've got this tunnel here built, okay? So you're sending information <coughs> across. And what happens is you put numbers on the information. Number one sent across. You see those are here. And then you're going to want to get a response back. So sending it across here, you're getting a response back. You send the next one across, you're getting a response back. But the thing is, that takes a long time. Because you're throwing it, you're, you're sending your packets, getting a response back, then you send another one. So what you have, what's known as windowing. And windowing is being able to send multiple packets in a stream of, of sessions before you get a response. Like let's say I'm throwing 100 tennis balls between this guy here and this guy, yeah? If I throw them one tennis ball at a time and he basically has to acknowledge one tennis ball, it's gonna take a long time for those tennis balls to get there. But what I could do is throw, double up, throw one tennis ball. It responds back to say it's received it by putting in a number. So let's say, let's look at this. So I'm sending a packet. I'm going to put in the number of one, a sin or sequence number of one, sequence number of one, right? 
The device tells me that it has received this by putting an acknowledgement of two, which is the next. So it's it's kind of saying, I expect the next sequence to have to start with two. That comes back to me. And then I say, oh, I know that the device has received it because I've received this acknowledgement of two. So what do I do? I add in, I double up, I send two packets with the sequence number two and the sequence number three. It sends me back an acknowledgement of four. That indicates to me that it has received sequence two and sequence three. What do I do? I double up. I send four, five, six, and seven. It sends me back an acknowledgement of seven. What happened? I dropped one. Dropped one. It didn't get to seven. So what do I do? I know that there's an issue. It can't process for whatever reason. The, the four are to get all together. So I resend the seven because it's reliable. And I send seven, eight, nine, and it sends me back an acknowledgement of ten. That means it, it can go much quicker than having you. So instead of throwing tennis balls, one tennis ball at a time, I can throw three or four tennis balls at a time. As long as the device over on the other end is able to catch those tennis balls successfully. It dropped one earlier on, so I had to resend it, and the tennis balls then I cut. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You don't have UDP windowing because you don't need it. You're just sending, 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 sending. Now you do have another protocol, I'm not gonna talk about now, that UDP uses as a way of sending it. It's called RDP, um, but we won't, we won't talk about it now. Well, it's 10 o'clock anyway. <laughs> uh, so what I'm gonna do guys is, I have a link for you on, I'm gonna, Pause. Actually, I, I don't know. I keep it short. I have a link for you. I'm going to put it on the chat now. And basically, um, it it has basically it'll CCNA stuff. So it's uh, it'll have. Let me just one second here. All the tutorials that I talked about today is in here. What is network introduction? How to change an IP address? Windows Windows 10 is the same. And. Um, what is default gateway IP information? And um, also, there's I'm gonna have all the slides that I've used on paint will be in there. All the video, the video, the, the recording will be in uh, uh, under day one as well. Um, and you can just go into Dropbox and you can access it that way. Okay, and just give me a second. I'm gonna set this up now. Uh, see where it is. Let me just pause recording on this.